You may be seated. Here now, a beautiful post-resurrection story in the Gospel of Luke. Now on the same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and talking with each other about all these things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing, Jesus himself came near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What are you discussing with each other while you are walking along? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, whose name was Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have taken place in these days? He asked them, What things? They replied, The things about Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and leaders handed him over to be condemned to death and, to be cru and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all of this, it is now the third day since these things took place. Moreover, some women of our group astounded us. They were at the tomb early this morning, and they did not find his body there. And they came back and told us that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see him. Then he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, and slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and then enter into his glory? Then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the things about himself and all the scriptures. As they came near the village to which they were going, he called ahead as if he were going on. He walked ahead as if he were going on. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, because it is almost evening, and the day is now nearly over. So he went to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took the bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Were not our hearts burning within us while he was walking, while he was walking, talking to us on the road, while he was opening the scriptures to us? That same hour they got up and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven and their companions gathered together. They were saying, The Lord has risen indeed, and he appeared to Simon. Then they told what happened on the road and how he had been made known to them in the breaking of the bread. What, what I see here is a wonderful story about Jesus taking on three different personas as he was walking with his disciples on the road to Emmaus. First of all, he was a stranger. They'd written recognize him. And then as they walked and talked together and as Jesus taught them, then he became their guest as they invited him to stay and to join with them for dinner that night. And then he became their host as he took the bread and he broke it. So let's look at this a little more closely. Jesus was a stranger. It's not unusual that Luke would describe it this way. The Luke, who was the writer of the Gospel of Luke and also the book of Acts of the Apostles, he was a Gentile. And so the audience that he was writing to would have been Gentiles, people who for the most part would not have been familiar or maybe had no knowledge at all of what the Jewish teachings and the prophets and, the te and, and customs were all about. So for those people, that audience, to talk about Jesus, who was from Nazareth, who was a part of this prophetic tradition and who is the Messiah would have been strange to them. Because one of the things that happens with most people who write books or who write stories, there is an audience they're trying to reach with a specific message. So here Luke masterfully is weaving the story together about these disciples. This is not one of the twelve, but one of the larger group of disciples of Jesus as they were heading home on Easter Sunday still very sad about the events and mystified by the events of that weekend. So yes, as they were on their way, Jesus comes to them as a stranger. They did not recognize him at all. And then, 
as they shared with him what was on their mind and what was in their heart. Jesus called them foolish, which I'm surprised he became a guest afterwards. <laughs> Usually that doesn't work. You, you dummy, you idiot, why do you, yeah, come on, be our guest. But Jesus says, oh, you're so foolish. Did not the Messiah have to be crucified and suffer what he did in order to bring God's glory to the earth? Did he not have to go through these things? And he went on through Moses and the prophets and interpreted it all for them as they were walking their seven miles. As they were reaching the village, then they saw that he was going to walk on by. And they said, no, 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 no. You're no longer a stranger. But now you are our guest. As I was looking at this part of the story, I had to remember in my own life when someone who I first saw, I didn't know who he was. He was a stranger to me. He, a guy named Keith Wilson, he's been here before. He, just, we and he and I have sung together, especially in the old church. Um, Keith came to my church with a group one time, performed, talked to them afterwards. They had guitars, thought that was pretty cool, so we like, talked about guitars, man, and all that fun stuff. And Then I didn't see him again afterwards, and then I went to my orientation at UCF, and in the same orientation group, there was Keith, and we both looked at each other and said, yeah, I've, I've met you, and from that moment on, he and I became best friends. We were strangers. But it's one of those things that once you just get to talking, you feel like you've known this person your whole life. Have you, have you experienced that? So someone in your life who was a stranger at first, as soon as you get to know who they are, they're a guest in your heart and your soul. You know them now. You feel like you've always known them. And Keith and I are still very, very close friends. So I feel like this is kind of what was happening with these disciples as they were traveling. Jesus at first was a stranger, but as they got to know him, there was something extremely familiar about him. And they knew that they didn't want to say goodbye yet, so they invited him in as their guest. And so when they were sitting around the table getting ready to have their meal, Jesus took the bread and he broke it in two, and then that and he blessed it and in that moment in that moment their eyes were opened and they saw who he was what had kept them blind why didn't they recognize him earlier they obviously recognized him on earth when he was walking about teaching and doing miracles what was it that kept him a stranger to their eyes I think that's a good question to ask us. We've heard about Jesus, most of us, our whole lives. There has never been a time in my life that I did not know Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. I have never not known that. But I've, never, but I've not always known Jesus. There were times in my life when he seemed like such a stranger and somebody so far away. What is it in us that even though we might have knowledge of Jesus, we still do not recognize him? Some of it's fear. Some of it's busyness and distraction. Some of it's bad theology. Some of it is preachers and teachers and book writers trying to make Jesus something that Jesus never was, but they need to make Jesus into this mold to fit their own agenda. It can be a, a lot of different things. The reality is for many of us, even though we know Jesus, we sing about Jesus, we read about Jesus, Jesus is somehow still a stranger to us. But when we invite him into our home, something changes. I shared with you last week about how I've studied Jungian psychology, and one of the things that Jung, Carl Jung did was about uh, teaching uh, and writing about dream interpretation and how in dream work a building a house is an archetype for your soul so notice that they invited Jesus into their house they invited Jesus into their what soul and as they sat and had communion 
or dinner with Jesus, that's when they recognized him. Not when Jesus was just up here. They heard all the intellectual stuff, the teachings and so forth, as they traveled down the road. That was all the stuff they knew in their head. It's when they opened their heart, their soul to Jesus, and he came in that something changed, something miraculous changed. I grew up hearing that if you let Jesus into your heart, and there was a very specific way to do that, that everything in your life would poof, be all magically perfect. Every little thing that ever been bad in your life would just go away. And wait, there's more if you act now. <laughs> but notice that Jesus had to be invited to come in. Maybe that's why Jesus is still a stranger to so many of us. We know about him, but we've never really asked him to come in to our soul and sit and commune with him, share a meal with him, get to know who he really is. When we do that, when it stops being an intellectual exercise and becomes something experiential. In other words, you get to know him in, what's the Greek word? Gnosko. Oh, students, you all, you know, I've been pounding that in your head now for almost 19 years and you've learned it. I'm so proud of you. It's, gnosko is the Greek word for knowing, but it's an experiential knowing. When you get to know him experientially, then it starts to transform something inside of you. As I was thinking about this, another experience in my life came to mind. When I lived in North Carolina many, many years ago, uh, I was a part of a program at North Carolina uh, State University called Friends of the College, and they had many different kinds of artists and performing groups come to Reynolds Stadium to perform. And Reynolds Stadium is a basketball stadium. And one of the performers was Leontine Price. Now, I had listened to some classical music, and I had heard some opera music, but I was not that familiar with it. And so I was sitting in Reynolds Auditorium. I can still picture myself. I was up on the upper level. I was looking down, and the stage was right here. And the speakers for the whole auditorium were right in the center of the, of the stadium, just like they are like at Amway Arena, right there in the middle. And all there was was a microphone in front of her and an orchestra behind her. And as she started singing, her voice was so big, her voice was so big that the speakers were cracking. The static was coming out of the speakers. Her voice was too big for the speakers and the top of the stadium, so the sound people eventually just turned the speakers off. And then something miraculous happened. Her voice, this one individual, as she started to sing, just filled the whole auditorium. And even though I wasn't that familiar to her, she was a stranger to me. As soon as she started singing, something in her voice and interaction took hold of my soul, and I connected with her on a very deep and beautiful level. It reminds me of that scene in Shawshank Redemption. Remember when Andy was in the warden's office? And he locked the door, and he put the album on, and he was playing a, an aria with two sopranos? And the guys in the, in, the, in the prison yard said, we had no idea what those two ladies were singing or what it was about. It was in Italian. But something came over us. That's exactly how I felt. Something came over me. Something came over me. And she went from stranger to guest to becoming the host because she had captured every heart and soul of every person there in that auditorium. Just by opening her soul and letting the music come out of her mouth, something transformative started to happen. And that's what I see in this story, that these disciples, Jesus was a, a stranger to them. Then they invited him in as their guest. And then as Jesus started to teach and Jesus started to break bread with them, then they recognized something in him. They recognized something incredible and something that their souls were yearning for. And I believe that that's why so many of us continue to seek Jesus, wanting to get to know Jesus, even though it still may be an intellectual experience for most of us. It's because when we take away all of the politics, 
that creates noise in our ears, when we take away all the cultural confusion that creates noise in our brain, when we take away all of the bad theology or the, the, the doctrines and the polity and who is right and who is wrong and who the real Jesus is, when we take all that stuff away and we just look at the stories and we see the things that he did for people, how he embraced everybody, how he met people where they were, how he healed, how he reached out to the most disenfranchised, how Jesus was the most beautiful, giving, healing, powerful human being that's ever walked this planet. When we just listen to the music of his presence upon this planet and it just covers us, then something starts to transform in our heart and soul. And now Jesus is more than an intellectual exercise, but now Jesus is a part of us. He's in our DNA. And I think that his teachings, his life, all that he did, there's something universal about it. And that's why we yearn for it. That's why we hope that maybe, yes, this is the one. It's because our souls, which are eternal, yearn to reconnect with those eternal truths. And the more you get to know him, then the greater your intimacy with him. If I had just recognized my friend Keith at orientation and just waved and said, hey, yeah, I remember you, and never done anything else, I would have missed out on what a beautiful, wonderful human being he is. I'd have missed out on that friendship. But you have to nurture those friendships for them to stay on, right? Okay, let me ask you. You have to nurture the friendships for them to be meaningful, right? Thank you. Don't make me work so hard. Hard for <laughs> you cannot expect to have a deep personal knowing of Jesus and God if you don't take time to nurture it. You have to create the time. You have to create the time. For those of you who are married or who have been married or who have been married several times, by the time your spouse starts saying, you know, I wish you would start paying attention to me more, it's kind of already too late. Okay, what is it you want? <laughs> start saving your money, call the lawyers. <clears throat> if the relationships that you have in life are deep and meaningful is because you've spent time nurturing them. And the person that you love is not just an idea that you have in your brain, but something that you experience in your heart, in your soul, in your body. It's the same with your spiritual relationship. It's always there. God is always there. God is always in the house. How much time do we spend nurturing that relationship? God knows us completely. So it's not a matter of God getting to know us. It's a matter of us getting to know God. Then something else happens. After Jesus breaks the bread and they recognize him, after they've walked seven miles, it's getting dark, what do those disciples do? Do they hang out overnight? What do they do? Immediately they get up and they go back to Jerusalem to tell the story. When you experience something so transformative as the actual presence of God in your heart, your mind, and your soul, it's not something you can keep hidden away. It's obvious in the things that you do. One of my favorite authors is Viktor Frankl. I've shared uh, him many times over the years. He has a book, Man's Search for Meaning. It's a very, very powerful book. He's a Holocaust survivor. And after surviving the Holocaust, he created a whole type of, of therapy that, that was connected to his experience. And one of the reasons why he was able to survive the Holocaust is because he was able to find purpose in his suffering. But he reached a, a very, very low point. He was in the concentration camp. He was at the end of his rope from deprivation. At this point, when he had lost 
every possession and every value destroyed, someone gave him a piece of bread. And here's what he wrote about that. I remember how a foreman secretly gave me a piece of bread which I knew he must have saved from his breakfast ration. It was far more than a small piece of bread which moved me to tears at that time. It was the human something this man also gave me, the word and the look which is accompanied, which accompanied the gift, that human something. That changed him around. Something as simple as a piece of bread turned him around. For the disciples on the road to Emmaus, a piece of bread turned them around. But what was it? Was it the bread itself? No. It was that human something. It was that God presence in the face of that person. It was the reaching out and touching. It was the, I am going to give you what I have because you are hungrier than I am. That human something. And so what I urge you to do, that if you still do not know this Jesus on an intimate level, open up your house and let him come in and live with him. Eat with him. Get to know who he is. It will transform your life. Not instantly. I wish it were that easy. But over the years, you will start knowing and being that human something in this world. You will start fulfilling and being what God created you to be. And as you encounter every human being on this planet, whether it is here, at the grocery store, at work, be that human something in their presence. Any kind of act of kindness to a person at any point in time can be that thing to turn them around and give them hope when they feel that they have lost everything. And that's what this story is about. It's after we experience and encounter the stranger, we invite him in. He's now a guest in our heart. And now that he's a guest, we got to know who he is. And so now he is our host. As Leontine Price was my host at Reynolds Auditorium, as she started to sing, and something in me started to transform, and then it set me on a journey. And that journey is a lifetime of study, reflection, meditation, prayer, and action, and fulfilling and being that human something that God has created us all to be. Thus ends the lesson. Let us pray.